everyone. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it's like to do <laughs> presentations <laughs> in virtual world. <laughs> If you have questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I assume you guys can unmute yourselves. Um, there's only a handful of you in the, the talk live. So um, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. This is really trying to help you guys. And so I'd love to, to get questions real time. This is my presentation about how to run an Apache project in traps and how to avoid them. So who am I? I was, uh, I'm Owen O'Malley. I am a uh, software engineer at LinkedIn and I have been working on Hadoop for a very long time. I started uh, in 2006 when I was at Yahoo and I was the first vice president of the Hadoop when it became a top level project. I'm a committer and PMC project on a bunch of different projects, uh, most notably Hadoop, Hive, Iceberg, and Orc. And I've been mentor for a wide range of projects over the years. Um, and so I haven't done an equally good job on all the, the projects I've mentored, but I've over the years, I've definitely seen a lot of things that work and a lot of things that don't work. And, that's a lot of what Apache is about, right? That's really what the incubator is for, is to help projects learn what things and what patterns work for Apache projects and what things don't work, what patterns cause problems later on. All right, so let's talk about what things to, to deal with when you're getting started. Now, before you go to Apache, a lot of times people get started in GitHub and then it's easy to get started on GitHub and not have any IP agreements. And that makes getting started super, super easy. And then you just put the code up and you can start taking patches from everyone and it works great. And then you, once you build a community, then it's easier to go into Apache. The downside of that is that you need to worry about who owns the code um, because by default, the contributions are still owned by the person who, who contributed the patch, which actually is still true once you're an Apache project, but it's very, very clear that when GitHub projects that haven't dealt with ICLAs, then the, the stuff is owned by the individuals that contributed it. And Apache, when you enter, requires the code grants for each large chunk of code. Those are formal legal documents that have to be signed by roughly a VP of your company. And that requires legal sign-offs for the, the company. Now, there are lots of different variants of this, but one case in particular where I got burned was Hortonworks and Vertica worked together to develop a C++ ORC reader uh, that was pure C++. Um, and we always intended to move the code to Apache. It was just easier to get started first and work back and forth. There were only two companies. Neither of them was a huge company, although they were both medium size and Vertica was, I guess, a large company. Um, but it still took months to get the code grant. And it was easier in Hortonworks because we were used to dealing with open source. But for Vertica, it took a long time to get the code grant. And so it delayed our ability to get started at Apache by a few months. and that could have been much, much easier if we'd started that process sooner. And if you get the IP agreements before you can commit in code, your life will be much easier. Now, 
Okay. Sorry, trying to go back and forth between the different windows. I should have done a better job of cleaning off all my other windows. Um, all right. Now the so that's the first mistake: not being super careful with who actually has permission to contribute this to Apache. Um, the second mistake is keeping your project a secret. I like to think of open source as a very uh, vibrant ecosystem. And one of the things, especially in the big data space that I've seen is that the nature just abhors a vacuum, right? You can almost guarantee that if there's a gap in the open source projects, there are going to end up being multiple teams all trying to address it, and they'll take slightly different takes on it. They'll do different things, and you'll end up with multiple projects, almost always two, sometimes three, um, that are trying to fill the gap. That creates choices for users and developers, which has some good things, although it also creates some confusion. And I've seen, <laughs> actually, once I was talking to a audience and they're like, can't you guys just make an API and then all the, the projects have to, to meet that API? And I was like, no, because you'd stifle the innovation. That's actually good that we get multiple choices, but it definitely creates confusion for the users. Um, and But the important part here is that it makes choices. Um, and your project is competing with other projects, both inside Apache and outside. And so you need to, to do everything you can to make your project success, successful. Now, one of the things that it doesn't mean is you can't appeal to the board and say, hey, we're the file format. You, no one else is allowed to do a file format because that's not the way Apache works. The Apache board doesn't pick who's going to be the winner in a particular space who's, and who's going to lose. Now, this is very different from the model that the GNU Foundation uses, right? GNU, they have one compiler, and that's the compiler that's the supported one. And if you want to work on a compiler, then you've got to work on that project. Apache is much more open than that, and they view the communities of as much more important than the actual code. So the saying inside of Apache is community over code, and it's real. The projects are really groups of people that want to work together much more than their code base, right? If one of the Apache projects wanted to switch to a completely different code base, that would be okay. They wouldn't actually even need to ask permission. Um, they could just do it. Where when they add new people to the project, that needs to get permission from, from the Apache board. Now that permission is almost always granted, but, but it's still the board's right to decide who gets to be on the project and who doesn't. And those groups of people are competing over people's attention and trying to uh, encourage adoption. And so you want to do everything you can to drive up adoption inside your project. So how do you do that? First of all, you advertise, uh, you make sure and uh, make your uh, building your project a priority. Now, one of the things I've seen incubator projects do badly sometimes is they leave the old site up, which just, then just creates confusion. You absolutely want to spend the effort to get your website into the Apache infrastructure so that you can fix all the naming and get everything uh, and take the old website down so that people don't refer to it anymore, right? You want Google to make the top hit for your project name, go to your apache.org address. You also want to give conference talks. You want to tell users about the new features. When I launched Orc, I ended up doing so many talks about Orc, um, and that helped a lot. You want to write blogs. You want to give use cases where it helped. You want to give experience production, right? Especially for the big data tools, that's an 
incredibly powerful saying, oh, we use this in production and we did it at the scale and, and this was our experience. And having a few different companies write those is hugely important. All right, any questions so far, actually? You guys are being very silent. I can't even tell. Let's see. Let me go over. Okay, got a few people. Um, you can either type in the chat or or just ask your questions verbally. Um, now, another challenge is not fostering diversity, and there are a couple of different ways. There's the obvious ones about helping uh, minorities and making people feel welcome. But the one I want to talk about first is actually with regard to employers. And Apache really is of two minds when it comes to employers. Um, in a lot of ways, they don't care who your employer is, and they want to be blind to the employers. But on the other hand, projects should encourage a diverse, diverse set of employers. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that it really encourages a much wider uh, viewpoint and encourages um, more diversity of thought and patterns. But it also protects you against a company deciding that it, that project isn't important and then scaling down the investment. The project is much more stable if it's got multiple people investing in it. Now, one part of that is that karma at Apache is tied to the person, not to the employers. Um, and you're expected to keep those hats separate, right? When you're voting on Apache things, you're supposed to vote with your Apache hat on, which means that you're expected to vote for the good of the project, not for the good of your company. And that is definitely a, a challenge at some points, but and um, I've definitely had to to help new projects work through that and how to keep those things separate. For example, one of the, the projects in the incubator was like, oh, we just hired uh, this new engineer or actually this list of engineers. We need to make them committers. And I had to explain to them that, no, that's not the way you do it. You have to follow the Apache process. You have to get them working on the project and contributing to it. And then they get voted in just like anyone else. They don't get special privileges because of who they work for uh, and uh, what they're hired to work on. Diversity also helps you with avoiding groupthink, right? Giving more voices and viewpoints is very good. Um, Back in the Hadoop days, we had a very vocal uh, user who was at Yahoo and he was not working on our team. He was just working in uh, the data science team using Hadoop to do his work. And he came up with some really great ideas and he implemented one of them and we're like, oh, that would be useful. And um, so he developed uh, Hadoop Streaming and it was super useful because now people, instead of having to write Java for writing MapReduce programs, now people could write Python and that just made it so much easier for people to think about and to, to use. And it came out of left field, right? The Hadoop team wouldn't have come up with it because we all knew Java. It was easy to write Java for us, but for the people who were used to Python, having it run Python and use standard input and standard output was much easier. And so it really drove a lot of Hadoop adoption inside of Yahoo because uh, we developed streaming for us. Any questions? <laughs> ah, you guys are being very silent. Um, another thing that you need to, to pay attention to is that don't assume all the smart people work at your company. Um, that one is particularly hard because you work with 
the people at your company and you're always interacting with them. And so the innovations can happen anywhere and it's important to, to keep those, keep that in mind. You also need to, to separate the company's goals from the projects, right? And there have been a couple of cases of this where I've seen people shoot down proposals and say, oh no, we don't want to do that for a couple of different reasons. The most offensive case in my uh, opinion was the one where they didn't want to compete with the uh, proprietary products of their company. That is pretty obviously across the line. Um, they should not have been doing that um, and they should have been much better about keeping their hats on separately and not uh, voting for their company's priorities instead of the project's priorities. Um, another case that's related is that it doesn't compete with the company's project, but it would create work for the proprietary product, right? Adding a feature to, to the open source version will then create work for the downstream and they don't want to do it. And so therefore they, they cut off a line of development in the open source project. And both of those are very bad. Um, definitely need to try and avoid those. And a final version of this that comes up is especially if your company is based around a open source project, promising features in upcoming versions. Um, for example, I've seen companies promise versions in Apache projects before those versions are released. And that's just not okay because the company has no control over what gets into that version. And so they shouldn't be making promises about what features will be in the version until after it's released. That also applies to the marketing team wanting to put out betas of the, the project, right? All of that needs to be very, very clear is it's not the upcoming release. All right, mistake four, <laughs> making decisions in person. Now, actually, I first gave a version of this talk a couple of years ago, and back then it was much less obvious how people should work remotely. Now, Apache has obviously been way, way ahead of the, the game um, in terms of the of working remotely because we've always been remote, right? When Apache started, it was primarily over email and um, and everything was asynchronous. So it was a you know remote only option, and people are much more familiar with that now. So, what goes wrong when you have meetings in person? First of all, it excludes the remote people. Um, I had um, one project that, you know, they were coordinating between a few companies and so they, they had gone into Apache Incubator and they wanted to have a video meeting to get their people together and they weren't sharing the video, you are, they weren't sharing the meeting link. And so that just excluded those people. But even at, once they started sharing the, the video link, then it's hard for people in different time zones, right? Because if you pick it, the time zone for Pacific or US Pacific, then you're going to be excluding the people in India or in China, right? And, or you're equivalently going to be excluding the people in Europe, right? So even video meetings are hard for people around the world and your project should be around the world, right? That's a good thing. Um, and especially holding roadmap meetings is problematic. So people will definitely get together. People definitely having have real time meetings. Um, but the right way to do that is to brainstorm 
um, well, provide full access to the community, right? Invite the community to the meeting. Use it as a brainstorming session and then bring the discussion back to the email list before, finally, before finalizing the decision. And that has a couple of different things. First of all, the email archives document the decision. So the decision um, is very um, transparent, right? You can see what um, the what people were thinking, what they were considering, what they were looking for. And you can also see who was going each way and what, what the arguments were. Now, when writing those messages back to the list, make sure to use I instead of we. That was some advice that was given to me early in my Apache journey, and it is super helpful because if you write we, then you're presenting the opinion of a group rather than yourself. And you want to say, you want to present your opinion, not the group's opinion, and let them speak for themselves on the list. And that will make your project go much better. And finally, yeah, just be welcoming in your community. Ah, Sharon points out that you guys can't unmute. So, um, so yeah, just ask questions in the chat if you have any. Okay, in incubator especially, um, one of the temptations is to make binary uh, artifacts as well as the source binary for your releases. And the problem is that they're super hard to review and get right. So I've seen more incubator projects stumble over their first release by trying to make uh, binary release, binary artifacts as part of the release. Now there are some things you can do to make that better. Right, there is this concept of reproducible builds, including their Maven plugins and C++ rules that you can follow that, that help make builds reproducible. And what you want out of a reproducible build is that anyone can go ahead and make exact, take the release and make exactly the same binaries. That's the goal. Right, so that it makes it easy to say, okay, as long as you start with this source and that version of the compiler, you're going to end up with those binaries. Um, now, the other part that makes binary releases hard to, to get um, right is that the licensing for binary effects is actually the transitive closure of all the dependencies. So every library you depend on and everything they depend on, the licensing is all of that. And so you really need for binary releases, you need to document all of those transitive closures and what licenses everything is under. So my recommendation is to hold release votes on just the source fact artifacts. Don't even roll the binaries. And then after the release passes, then you can make convenience binaries and push things into Maven and, um, and do that. Now, if you need to make RPMs and such, that's actually even better done downstream um, and not out of the Apache project, in my opinion. Okay, so that was the early stuff. Now, what happens when you're going forward? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, one of the challenges, especially for the big projects, is holding the committer bar, the bar too high to become a committer and a PMC member. And I've seen ones where it requires hundreds or thousands of patches committed before someone's allowed to be a committer. Um, that really sucks. Um, someone, I mean, someone has been investing a lot of time in the project and understands it really well, but that makes it super exclusive to, to get in. Um, and what makes it worse is if the project has a huge patch queue. Um, and especially if you don't work with someone who's already a committer, 
getting someone to look at your patches in one of those is really, really hard. Hadoop, for example, has, well, actually, this number is probably old, 3.6 thousand uncommitted patches <laughs> since 2006. That's a lot of patches. And so if you get, um, if you're trying to contribute, but you don't have anyone to review because you don't have any con personal connections to a committer who can do the review, that makes getting even a handful of patches committed super hard. And it makes it almost impossible to get up to hundreds or thousands of patches. Um, and part of what you're doing is you're actually making it worse, right? Because if you've got a committer shortage, what that means is you don't have enough people reviewing patches. And who are the people who can review patches? Committers. <laughs> so you're reinforcing the cycle by holding the bar high. You're making it so that nothing can get committed and therefore even fewer people can contribute. And this gets back to what we're saying. You're hurting your community, right? It, you're making it hard for someone to get into this community who isn't being paid to work on this project full time. And that that really lowers your diversity. Uh, I mean, fortunately in the big data space, we have a lot of people who are paid to work on the projects. And so the majority of the projects I've been associated with most of the developers have been paid developers, but there have always been a handful or, or more actually that have been doing it in their, their free time. And to get to a really high committer bar at that point is almost impossible. But the important things to look for in a committer is knowing, uh, is having good taste, right? They need to know whether a patch is a good thing or a bad thing and knowing their own limits. It's fine if they only know this piece of the code, as long as they aren't going to go committing patches over in left field, right? So I'm against enforcing those rules, but people who know their own limits, I'm much more willing to make them committers than people who bravely go and make changes across the board. Ah, trademarks. <laughs> Trademarks is always a challenge. Uh, now, when you're getting started, that that um, always comes down to making sure that your project doesn't use another trademark. And like most legal things, it can come down to a judgment about risk. Uh, Doug Cutting, who started Hadoop and Lucene, likes to to make projects that have very unique names. And his goal is always to make it so that there are only a handful of hits on it when you Google it before the project starts. So that whenever someone starts Googling your project name, they they uh, get your project. Now, he was lucky that he had young kids and they would create names like Notch and uh, Hadoop. But, but for the rest of us, it comes down to a judgment call, right? You need to decide, um, okay, we really want to be called this and there's very little chance or you have to assess the chance that someone is going to get mad and force you to change later because you're much better off changing sooner rather than later. Um, so you'd much rather change it um, before you start than, than halfway through because Part of what you're building is your brand. And that brand is much easier if you don't have to change it later. <sighs> now, I mean, one particularly unfortunate case of this wasn't at Apache, actually. Apache wouldn't have allowed it. Um, but Presto forked off of um, out of Facebook and they were both called Presto for a while and then Facebook actually registered the trademark, and so the, the Trino guys had to rename. And I think it's good that they renamed. I am very supportive of, of that, it, but if that is frustrating because they built a lot of brands using Presto, and then they had to redo it using Trino. 
Um, the other half of trademarks is making sure that other people don't abuse your trademarks. And my experience is that it's super hard to get anyone who isn't using, who is a non-project member to adjust their use of your trademark. It just, you have very few levers to throw at them because realistically Apache isn't going to sue them for filing your trademark. The one exception to that is if the company has uh, committers and PMC members, then project members are absolutely responsible for fixing their company's behavior. And in fact, the board has removed PMC members from projects. And actually, they removed all the PMC members that belong to the offending company and told them that they would have to run it back. They could and they did it precisely because the company was abusing the Apache trademarks. Now, one of the things that we did at Hortonworks was we actually developed training for both the engineers and the marketing team. <laughs> actually, the engineers, it was almost easier. The marketing team was more important um, because the marketing team is much more visible. And so you need to to be able to see. They need to understand what the rules are about what the trademarks are and who owns them and what the what they need to do to make the marketing okay. All right. Now, if you're at a company, have your employees working on open source, what can go wrong? Well, one of the things is to treat the open source stuff as the employees doing it on their own. And all the companies that do open source well, they actually make it part of the engineer's objectives and you know, code contributions, document contributions, presentations, all of those are important and they get reflected in the, the employee's goals. One of the ones that's hard to get, but is actually important to actually, um, I've seen a couple companies actually collect metrics about code reviews, but that's actually super uh, Im impactful for the community by making code reviews something that, that people are explicitly encouraged to do. Um, and then making the manager's goals reflect the community time is also super important. Oh, thanks, Claude. Yeah, that's a that's a good thing. Um, actually, I guess I should have also included doing things like using Apache Rat to. <laughs> yes, many of us get paid. Um, actually, in the big data space, a lot of the projects are uh, people who get paid for the most part. There are always people who are contributing uh, without being paid, but a lot of us get paid. All right, <laughs> now going back to airing some of the dirty laundry. Um, one of the things you don't want to do is doing stealth development, doing um, um, if you are developing offline and or non-public and that really breaks the community. It both cuts off the community from participating in your branch and it will effectively stop the project if it's too big of a fork. So for example, Yahoo decided to work on Hadoop security privately. Now we did it for a lot of reasons that management thought was important, but, but we did it. And so early in Hadoop, the release train was super predictable. We were releasing every three to four months. So 018, 019, 020, each were three to four months. And then that's where Yahoo forked and basically went dark. Um, so there was 12 months to get to 0 
And that's where Facebook and LinkedIn forked off and basically had internal forks. And so the community was pretty much left withering on 021. Now, Yahoo decided, or we decided while well, I was at Yahoo, that, that that had been a mistake, but we couldn't get security back and still pick up 21. So we created a new branch off of 0 0.20 and basically made the 0 0.20.203, and then we actually had a, another bug fix after that. And that was 24 months after 0 0.20. And it was a big mess. And even recovering from that, then getting to 1.0, which was the next release that unified 0 0.21 and the security stuff, was eight more months after that. And so stealth development may seem like a good plan, but it really, I strongly discourage it. Ah, uh, licensing problems. <laughs> you really need to watch licensing. Uh, if you pull code into your project, it has to have a permissive license, right? So it has to be Apache, BSD, MIT, right? Those are the, the easy ones. You can have a binary dependency on the weak copyleft licenses, things like Eclipse, Mozilla, and Creative Commons. But uh, then, but there's a license called Category X, and um, those you can only do very specific things, and those are GPL, LGPL, JSON, and uh, CC by A. Um, Okay, does anyone know why JSON is a problem? Just type it into the chat. It's actually a very permissive license, but Apache doesn't let you use it. And <laughs> okay, so the developer of JSON liked the BSD license, so they used BSD, but they wanted to be cute. And so they put in a clause saying, this software shall be used for good, not evil. <laughs> and, um, so if you end up at a company that has super picky lawyers, they, um, they really dislike that. And so they, so Apache decided that it wasn't a reasonable end use restriction, because that's really what it is, is an end use restriction. And they weren't willing to transitively depend on anything that was going to, <laughs> to say that you couldn't be evil because evil's not defined very well. And um, exactly. And the there's this talk where the JSON developer talks about it and he says that um, IBM, kept hectoring him for every couple of years about it. And eventually he wrote them an addendum that said that IBM and its and their customers were allowed to use the software for evil. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's almost worse. But but that's why we don't allow Jason. Um, and yeah, that includes the transitive dependencies. Yeah, the IDE ones is hard and it's not clear what those include. Um, one of the cases where we could get, we got stuck was we upgraded the air compressor from 0 0.10 to 0 0.15 to get the Z standard. And we had excluded the slice dependency previously, but slice depended on Joel core, which is GPL. Fortunately, the use of slice was a single method. So we realized that we had this picked up this GPL dependency and worked with the air compressor guys to get a fix. Basically, they copied the relevant method over and re-implemented it so that they didn't have to fix it. And then dealing with, um, so then we could depend on the new version. Um, obviously, copying code from um, Stack Overflow has the same problem. And I see I'm running out of time. So summary. 
build your community, give talks, make your website approachable, make your project easy to build, right? If the first thing someone does with their project doesn't, it fails to build, that sucks and will, will hurt your community and make your community friendly. Do your work in the open. Don't do private forks. Don't do, <laughs> don't do lots of development on the side. And finally, train your employees in Apache and open source. And if you want the slides to the Hortonworks training, there it is. It's s.apache.org is the the short URL, the tiny URL for Apache, and it's just a Apache training. Thank you very much. That's my talk. I ran one minute over. <laughs> Any final questions? Let's see, what does Nicole ask? Okay, so Nicole asked, how would a single developer get started? And, oh, sure. Um, actually, let me go back to it. You guys can't see how badly I'm typing. Um, the question is, how do um, new developers get started? And actually, I'd, some projects have newbie tags in their JIRAs, and that can give you some good ones to work on. Um, find some small things to get started with first and then actually ask on the dev list, hey, I was thinking about working on this. Does that make sense? Those are the kinds of things that I would do, but definitely start small. Um, start on something relatively straightforward, especially something that has caused you annoyance is a really good way to get started. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, and um, I've, in, I've enjoyed giving the talk. Maybe next year we can actually do this in person. <laughs> oh, how do you start? <laughs> how do you start a new project? Um, okay, then you would need to make. The hard part is, um, sorry, I misread your question, Nicole. Um, the thing is, then you'd want to get it to the point where it's at least the starts of useful, right? You'd need to to build enough of it in public, and, or build it enough of it to to be to show people what you're going to do, and make start making it useful for people. So you can absolutely do that. Um, and most projects aren't going to build community, but definitely um, if what you want to build is a sustainable project, then talk to your friends, right? Figure out who else was, wants to work on it with you um, and build your, build out your community that way. The other thing is going and talking to people at um, who are in that area and just reach out to them on um, Apache Slack or ApacheCon and, and say, hey, how I've got a project like this. Would you be interested in it? Um, would you be a sponsor in Apache Incubator? And, um, and move forward from there. Yes, they do. Very much. Thank you, Claude. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone.